Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. series of sermons on the heart. Um, the heart is something that we talk about often. The heart is something that we sing about often. And, and I'm not sure that we know exactly what we're talking about or singing about, but we know that it's important. And culturally, we define the heart as your emotions, your feelings, and your affections. That's what we think about when we think about heart. But biblically, it has a different definition. Biblically, uh, a definition of the heart includes your mind, your will, your personality, and your emotions. And it is your essence, what makes you, you. If you think about it and, and, and you find out that you're pregnant and then you go to get an ultrasound, the first thing that they're looking for, the sign of life, is a heartbeat. And the Bible teaches that your whole life flows from your heart. And so that's why we're talking about the heart. It's important. Jesus addressed it quite a bit. It's a mega theme in scripture. And so we want to talk about the heart. If you remember the first week we talked about keeping your heart with all diligence, or sorry, with all vigilance. Uh, The next week we talked about trusting the Lord with all your heart. What does that mean to trust him with all of your heart? The week after that, we talked about forgiving from the heart. And then last week, it was a charge or a challenge to take heart, take courage. So we've been talking a lot about uh, what, what, what is it? What is the heart? When we talk about the heart, when we sing about the heart, what exactly are we talking about? What exactly are we singing about? This morning, this morning is a little bit different in that we're not going to take a lot of time defining heart or talking about what it is. We're going to talk about how, how can you know it? How can you know what's in your heart? How can you say things with confidence like, he's got a good heart? Well, they've got a good heart. Well, that's not necessarily what's in their heart, or that's not the heart of the matter. How do you know uh, what's in your heart? Um, we usually say that, Well, he's got a good heart to basically cover for someone's screw up, to say, well, they had good intentions, they meant well, but how do we actually know that someone has a good heart? How do you, how do you know the heart? How can you know it? The Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? It's deceitful above all things. Who gets it? Why do we do what we do? I, I spend a lot of my day trying to figure out why people do what they do. And the truth is, is I can't even figure out why I do what I do. It's a mystery. My motives are hard to pinned down. I don't know exactly what's going on inside. There, there's a couple things that we do on the outside that will tell you the character of a man or a woman on the inside. There's a couple things that Jesus said will reveal your heart. It's deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then Jesus says, There's a couple things that we do on the outside that are a sure sign of what's going on on the inside. There are a couple things that we do that are something of a status update. Where if you want to know, well, what is going on in my heart? What am I talking about? What's really going on in there? You can look at two things and they will tell you the state of a man or a woman's heart. Jesus said that you can know 
a heart if you watch a man's mouth and you watch his money. Those are two things that he said go on on the outside and reveal what's going on on the inside. Money is a great indicator of what's important to you. We're constantly ascribing value and worth to things with our money. Matthew 6.19, Jesus says, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your treasure reveals your heart, and your talk also reveals your heart. If you think about it this way, Your money flows effortlessly to the things that give you identity. I don't have to ask you to spend money on the things that bring you identity, comfort, and security. I have to ask you to stop spending money on the things that bring you identity, comfort, and security. Your money will flow effortlessly to the things that you value. You don't have to, you know, every week some preacher gets up here. It's worth it, guys. You know, give, you know, every week. Not that that's what Mark's charge sounded like today. (laughs) But, But you've heard it before, every week. Your, Your money, your treasure, goes to the things you treasure without even thinking about it. It reveals your heart. What you do with your treasure, what you do with your time, what you do with your talent, what you do with those things will reveal what you value, what you look to for identity, what you look to for security, and what you look to for comfort. It's not just what you spend that will reveal your heart. What you say will also reveal your heart. Jesus in Luke 6, 45 says, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And this is what we'll spend our time this morning talking about. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Once again, Jesus is saying the problem isn't outside of us. The problem is actually inside. It's an inside job. It's not what comes into a man that defiles a man. It's what comes out of a man that defiles a man. So I want to talk about our talk uh, speech this morning on our speech and what it reveals. Because it's not just a slip of the tongue. It's a show of the heart. And I wish I could tell you now that I was going to give you five things to do to tame your tongue. I wish I could tell you right now that, um, you know, I had, you know, if if it's not nice, you know, don't say it at all. Or like I had some things that were going to help you keep your tongue under control. But your tongue is not the issue. It's your heart. You don't need to wash your mouth out. You need to wash your heart out. Because out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. You don't have a foul mouth. You have a foul heart. It's way worse than you thought it, it was. <laughs> you, you do, though, need to know these things about your words. And uh, forgive me, it's, it's difficult. I mean, your words and your mouth, I mean, this should be a whole series in itself. Um, Proverbs alone has... Dozens of scriptures regarding your mouth and your words. So please, I've included in the bulletin some scriptures to look up. Spend some time this week looking up those passages and asking the Holy Spirit to search your heart, reveal things to you as you read His Word. So this this won't um, be as thorough as I'd like it to be, but there are a few things that I want you to know about your words. 
you maybe know these things, have heard these things before, and maybe all that I'm doing this morning is reminding you. It was a very good reminder for me this week. Church, you need to know that talk is not cheap. It's revelation. Talk is not cheap. Words reveal your heart. They give us a glimpse of what's going on on the inside. They reveal a man's heart. It's not cheap. It's revelation for us. Pay attention to what you're saying because it's revealing what's really going on inside of you. In fact, this, this, this statement, saying to someone, hey, talk's cheap, buddy, that, that comes from someone who actually does not believe that talk is cheap. That's coming from a person who went to the bank with something you said and was seriously disappointed because you didn't take your words seriously. Even the person who says talk is cheap doesn't mean that. They've been disappointed because they took what you said seriously. And now they're seriously hurt because of it. Your words are important. They're anything but cheap. They're going to cost you. They will cost you. Even when you say something you don't mean, it is helpful to reveal things to us. Am I right? Sometimes I say things that I don't mean, and even that reveals something to me. Like namely this huge gap between who I am and who I say I am. And you're staring at this gap going, wow, I didn't mean a word I said right now. (laughs) This is very telling. This is very revealing. It's not cheap. It's revelation. It will reveal your heart. Jesus is saying that you can tell a lot about a person by looking at their tongue. Your tongue will reveal your character, who you really are. You can tell a lot from the tongue. Has anyone ever... um, I had some back problems a couple years ago, and nothing was helping, Um, and and so someone recommended that I do acupuncture. Anyone ever done acupuncture? That was a crazy experience, and it was, in fact, alternative medicine. I've never experienced anything like that. I get there, and I sit down, and I start explaining to her what's going on. Well, my back, and this is what's going on with my back, and this is where in my back. And then she goes, stick out your tongue. I was like, no, my tongue is fine. (laughs) It's my back, like namely like right here, right here is the problem. Stick out your tongue. So I go, okay, and I stick out my tongue. And she says, why is your tongue so pale? I said, I don't know. Why does my back hurt? (laughs) I'm here because my back hurts, you know? Then, then she says to me, why are you so stressed out? And I was like, I, maybe because my back hurts. <laughs> I'm here to talk to you about my back, you know. But you can tell, apparently, I'm not a doctor. And I I'm certainly don't, you know, dabble in alternative medicine, you know. But it's like, apparently you can tell a lot about a person by looking at their tongue. You know, and the whole time I said, I'm out of here. I don't know what this is about. I'm telling you, I have back problems. And you keep talking about how my tongue's pale and how I'm stressed out. And I'm out of here. I don't like your TNC surf signs anyways. I'm gone, you know. So Jesus is saying, you can tell a lot about a person by looking at their tongue. You know what's inside a man or a woman. Your speech, your talk, your tongue will reveal your heart. Um, Just like fruit tells us about a tree, your tongue tells us about who you are. We know a tree by its fruit. Jesus said this in a passage concerning your heart. We will know a tree by its fruit. Luke 6.43, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. 
For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. We know a tree by its fruit, you can know a man by his mouth. We, Tiffany and I moved into a new house, there's these incredible fruit trees in the backyard, I'm really excited about the fruit trees. I don't know what four or five of them are yet. Because I walked back there, and I saw rotten grapefruit, and so I thought to myself, this must be a grapefruit tree. And then I moved one down, and I saw rotten oranges, and I thought, aha, an orange tree. But there was a few that didn't have any fruit, and I found myself going, I guess I will just have to wait, I'll just have to wait, because you know a tree by its fruit. Have you ever tried to identify what type of tree you're looking at when it's got no fruit, it's got no color on it, and you're left there going, I don't know what this is. My wife and I um, have decided that we think one of the trees is a fuyu tree, just made that up. One of them we think is a cherry tree. One of them I was told by my uncle who's a landscaper on Friday night that it's an apple tree. I have no clue because I know a tree by its fruit. Unless I can see some fruit on it, I don't know what kind of a tree it is. Jesus is saying, you know a tree by its fruit. You'll recognize a tree by its fruit, and you'll recognize a man if you listen to what's coming out of his mouth. This this is a, a troubling statement by Jesus. The statement that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it's troubling for me um, because we can no longer say, I didn't mean to say that. It's troubling to me because I can no longer say, I don't know where that came from. That must have been the booze talking. I don't know where that came from. We know where that comes from. That came from your heart. Out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. So that means that you no longer get to go to your kids and say, Daddy didn't mean to say that. What you mean when you say, I didn't mean to say that, is that if my mind was engaged in what I was saying, I would not have said that. What you mean when you say, I didn't mean to say that, is I usually filter that stuff out, and it slipped through. What you mean when you say that was the alcohol talking, or that was the booze talking, is that usually you filter stuff out, but you've had so much unfiltered beer that you can no longer filter stuff out. That's what you mean when you say, I didn't mean to say that. We can no longer say, I don't know where that came from. We have to take a look inside and go, I know where that came from. It may have been a slip of the tongue, but it was certainly a show of my heart. God, what is going on inside? Why did I respond the way I, oh, it's because he did this or she did this. No, no, no. They bumped you, but it was inside of you to begin with. Nothing comes out of a man that wasn't first in him to begin with. Nothing comes out that wasn't first in there. Talk is not cheap. Talk reveals the heart. The second thing that you need to know is that sticks and stones will break your bones and so will words. They'll hurt you. I can't think I I can't think of a more ridiculous lie than sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Again, a defense mechanism. Because you know that it's hurting and it's hurting bad. You know that words carry weight. You can remember right now specific things that were said by specific people. You know where you were at. You know what you were wearing. You know how old you were because you're scarred for life because of things that people have said to you. You remember 
being called fat. You remember being called worthless. You remember being called ugly. You remember those things, and we can shrug that off like, huh, you know, that was so long ago. And you can remember who said it, where you were at when they said it, and what you were wearing when they said it. To say that sticks and stones will break your bones and words will never hurt you is a lie. A lie that we tell ourselves. Words carry incredible weight. And I think that's precisely because they aren't just words. They flow from the heart. They aren't just syllables and sounds. There's some weight behind them because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is, there is so much power in what we say for good and for harm. It's not just that you remember the harmful things said to you or the hurtful things said to you. You can remember when someone called you out and called you up and said something very encouraging to you. You can remember it. It's not just that they're powerful for harm. They're powerful for good as well. You can remember specific times and specific things that people said when they called you up and called you out. It's incredibly impacting. For better or for worse, words are incredibly powerful and have a huge impact on our lives. God, if, you, if you've read your Bible, you know that he's always changing people's names calling people out, calling people up. And here's what's interesting is that when we give names to things, we're describing things. But when God gives names to things, He's determining things. This is who you will be. And He calls people up. He calls people out. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about the early disciples. You know, they spend three years with Jesus, and Jesus is about to leave and turn the whole thing over to them. And they must have felt completely overwhelmed by Jesus delegating authority to them and saying, you march this thing forward. Must have been incredibly overwhelming to them. And just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he says these things to his disciples. And I was thinking, how empowering this must have been to hear these words from Jesus. How empowering it must have been in a very confusing, very overwhelming time for Jesus to look at his disciples and say thing, these things to him. Jesus is getting ready to ascend and his disciples say to him, Lord, hey, well, at this time, will you, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And then he says to them in a really vague, I'm sure frustrating way, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. You're getting no more details from me, gents. I got no times. I got no dates for you. Sorry about that. And then he looks at these guys who've just abandoned him. They're not charging through the finish line. These guys tripped through the finish line. And he picks these guys up. And he says to him, you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Talk about called up and called out. Talk about words that had an impact on these guys. Hey, are you going to do this because somebody needs to do this? You. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Power is going to come on you. You're going to be my witnesses. You're the guy, you got this. I've equipped you, I've given you everything you need to do what I'm telling you to do. I mean, I can feel myself being like, what a charge this must have been. You're it, and you got this. And I believe in you, I've got confidence in you. I've given you what you need to do, what I've asked you to do. Words are incredibly impacting. You can make someone's day. Leaving today, don't think, well, I better not say something harsh. It could really have an impact on someone. That's true. But you should be thinking to yourself, you could leave today, say something to someone that would have a huge impact on their week, potentially their life. And I know some of you men are thinking, well, I'm not a talker, even more. When it comes from you, it means a lot. You can make someone's week. 
by leaving here, looking someone in the face and saying, you've got this. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've got everything you need for life and godliness. I see it. I spot it in you. And I'm calling it out. Really, really powerful. Words are weighty. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Sticks and stones will break my bones and words will kill me. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I wish I could tell you that the Bible says that good and bad are in the power of the tongue. That you can say some good things and you can say some bad things, so do what you can to say some good things. No, no, no. You can speak life over someone or you can speak death over someone. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, not just good and bad. And you can speak life over someone as you leave here today. There's no neutral exchange. No third category provided for us here. There's death and then there's life. And then there's this massive gray area where we make small talk most days. No, you're either giving life or taking life with every conversation you have. How many of you have ever had a conversation where you thought, I, something was taken from me. In the process of this conversation, something was taken. I feel drained, I feel sapped, and I need to take a shower. I don't know what happened, but they took life. You can either give life in conversation or you can take life in conversation. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You are sowing with your words. Sowing with your words. Constantly sowing into someone's life. And it will produce a harvest. What are you sowing into them? What are you planting into them with your words? You're sowing death or sowing life with your words. And it will sprout up. It will produce a harvest in someone's life. And you will reap what you sow. Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. You're constantly sowing with your words. In the New Living Translation, don't be misled. You can't mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. You will always. God will not be mocked. You will always harvest what you plant. You're sowing death or sowing life into a relationship, into a church, into a situation with your words. Constantly planting death or life and you will reap what you sow. What are you planting in your kids? What are you planting in your family? What are you planting in your friends? What are you planting in this church? What are you planting at your work? You will reap what you sow. Sow life. Speak blessing. Use your mouth to make an impact, to speak life over the people closest to you. The tongue has incredible power. It's disproportionate, James says. It's hard to believe that such a little thing packs such a punch. I have to be careful as I read this passage to you. I love analogies. I love God. I love my family. And I love analogies. I love analogies. And this has got some of the best analogies in the Bible. So keep me accountable. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. You get control on your tongue, you beat the game. There's nothing you can't conquer. Able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. 
The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. You know how that happens, right? You got a good shirt with just one stain on it, and that shirt is ruined by that stain. It'll probably happen to some of you when you leave here. Salsa. Salsa. (laughs) Setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth the same From the same opening, both fresh and salt water, can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Such a small thing, and it can do so much harm. The bit that you put into a beast's mouth weighs just a couple pounds, and it controls an animal that weighs, I don't know, how much does a horse weigh? Come on, someone's got to know. A million pounds for the sake of sermons. What would you say, Paul? 1,650 pounds. This is the idea that something that weighs just a couple pounds can be put in the mouth of something that weighs 1,650 pounds and control it. Such a small thing has such an impact. Your tongue has disproportionate amounts of power. It's a small thing, but it's incredibly significant. My third point is this. I, I, I'm not going to blame this on God, but I chose these words prayerfully, <laughs> and I chose these words carefully. God has nothing to do with this. I let him off the hook. I chose these words prayerfully, and I chose these words carefully, and I mean to say something by saying this, because we don't believe this. Which one of these has caused more destruction and more pain in your life? Saying it or or talking it? Let's vote. Yeah? What's going to cause more destruction in this church? Me saying this word from the pulpit, or you talking about me at lunch after I say it from the pulpit? What will cause more trouble in this church? What type of destruction have you witnessed? My fear is that we're trying to treat a cold while running around with cancer. I would say your vulgarity or your cussing is something of a cold. Your gossip is a cancer that will destroy this body. Think about this. You would, maybe some of you have your kids here. Maybe you're leaving with your kids right now. (laughs) Sorry. I know that's not true. That's why I called her out. And Scotty's bringing a kid in just for, <laughs> just to make up for it. Thanks, Scotty. You would, 
you would cover your kids' ears to keep them away from foul language. And then you'd gossip in front of them daily. You would rebuke your uncle for talking like this in front of your kids. And then you would talk about your uncle in the minivan on the way home. You would keep your kids from movies that have foul language. And then every day they hear you on the phone slander somebody by casting a shadow on their character. Your divisive speech, your gossip is detestable to God. Far more serious than you think it is. For us, cussing is detestable and gossip is acceptable. And I can tell you that as if, if I you know, leave here and spend my Saturday at the planing mill and have conversations with people about why they left the church, none of them would say that they left the church because of cussing. And many of them would say that they left the church because of gossiping. One is far more destructive than the other. I'm not saying that either are good. But I'm saying that we're taking our time treating a cold while this body gets eaten with cancer. It's serious. It's detestable. Ephesians says, and, and, and this is a reference to divisive speech. Paul is talking about the type of speech that would divide a body. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear it. When Paul talks about corrupting speech, some of your translation says unwholesome speech or let no evil speech. He's talking about gossip, slander, and slurs, not about cussing. That's not what Paul is talking about here. That's not what he's addressing when he says let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. This word saffros that's used here means rotten. Let no rotten speech come out of your mouth. The only other time this word saffros is used in the New Testament, it's used by Jesus when he said, no good tree bears rotten fruit. The only other time it's used, it's used in reference to the way that you talk and what flows from your heart. Let no rotten speech go on. The gossip. That's, that is that when you share something with someone who's not a part of the problem or the solution. It doesn't even have to be bad things. You're just talking to the wrong person about those things. Slander Slander, sl- slander is accusatory. That's accusatory speech. Slurs, casting a shadow on someone's character. It's rotten. And what Jesus and Paul mean to say by that is that it's rotten. It doesn't nourish the body. Anything that's rotten does not nourish. Anything that's rotten smells and creates unpleasant environments. Your speech is rotten. It smells and it's creating unpleasant environments. It's it causes you to be sick. Ro- something that's rotten will transmit disease. And I fear that at times even our prayer chains are transmitting disease. I wish that I could give you these, these are the five easy steps to taming uh, your tongue. But it's an issue of the heart. Out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. I spent the week thinking on on this subject, thinking about our words, thinking about how they're not cheap and how they reveal what's in our heart, um, reading passages about the power of the tongue. And on Thursday night, we had all sons and daughters here. How many people here for the all sons and daughters show? It was um, a tremendous time. I, I, I love those guys. They are our rock stars. And so we worked really um, hard to create a space for them that would be a pleasant space for them. 
And uh, after the show, I find myself talking to David, who is the lead singer of All Sons and Daughters. And we're talking, having a great conversation. Um, and I'm talking to him about how hi- no one's songs are leading our church in worship like their songs are. And uh, that what they're doing on the other side of our nation is having a huge impact on us. We're just talking it up, you know. And at, at a certain point, he goes, you and your wife come to Nashville. I'm serious. Come stay with us. And then I say this to him. Oh, we've been to the South one other time, and we were there to stay with John Mark McMillan. And I knew immediately that I name dropped. I knew what I was doing. I knew why I did it. And I knew what I was looking for by doing it. And as the conversation went on, I just felt more and more convicted until I looked at him. Because I, I knew it came from my heart. A desire to be something in his eyes, a desire to connect, a desire for him to think I'm something I'm not. And I finally just said, hey, look, man. I was like, I just name dropped. And I did it on purpose. And I did it because I wanted you to think I was cool. And I did it because I wanted to connect with you. But I, but I did that. And he goes, oh, I didn't notice And I was like, of course you didn't. Of course I would have got away with this if I didn't just wrap myself out. (laughs) And I was like, the Lord's dealing with me, with my mouth, and with what's flowing from my heart. And I know what my heart was looking for when I said those things. And he said, well, I forgive you. And And I said, thanks for that. And then the rest of the night I just felt embarrassed. Like, maybe I shouldn't have said it. I brought it up with Tiff. She was like, what were you guys talking about? I name dropped, and then I told him that I did it. And she was like, why'd you do that? And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) I would have got away with it. And we would have got to go to his house, and now we can't. (laughs) And I... uh, I woke up the next morning, and I was still thinking about it. I felt embarrassed. I had regret. I thought maybe I shouldn't have shared what was really up for me. And uh, I thought about it at 9 o'clock. I was thinking about it at 10 o'clock. I was thinking about it at 11 o'clock. And then what rose up was I had this, I had this secret desire that he was still going to pursue me. I had this secret desire that I was going to wake up and there was going to be an email in my inbox that said, Hey, Trav, thanks for being so honest and vulnerable. And you can still come to my house, even though you're, you lie and you make stuff up. You know, like, I still, even though your heart, you know, I just, I just wanted to be received. And, and, I, and I wanted to still be invited. And I wondered if having seen my weakness, if this guy still liked uh, me. And I, I found myself longing, hoping that he would find me and still invite me. And it was at about 11 o'clock in the morning (laughs) when I realized I was asking a man to do what no man could do. And I found myself saying, Jesus, you're what I want. You're the one who still, you know me and you love me. You've seen my weakness and you're still inviting me. You know what's in my heart and you're still calling me to come. You know why I do the things I do. I don't even know why I do the things that I do. And you still want me. The invitation still stands for a person like me. Someone that insecure who uses his mouth to do those type of things. The invitation still stands. And I found myself just rejoicing. Jesus, thank you for pursuing me. Thank you that you know me and you still want me. You know what's in my heart and you're still calling me by name. You're still pursuing me even in my weakness. Even in my weakness, there are emails in my inbox. You're still knocking even though you see my weakness. Sean, would you come? God is still inviting us. 
I think it's impossible to bring up a subject like, if anyone's here and isn't convicted, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) Go home, read those scriptures, and come back, and if it still doesn't work, I'll give you some more. God's still inviting. You're going to have to account for every careless word that comes from your mouth. That means he knows the stupid stuff that you say and why you say it. And he's still saying, come on, come to me. Isaiah, the prophet, called by God to speak on God's behalf. He had a lot of things to say as a prophet. Woe to you guys. Woe to you guys. Woe to you guys. Woe to you. You don't get it right. Woe to you. You don't get it right. Woe to this group over here. You don't get it right. Woe to y'all. He's good at it. And then God shows up. And the cry becomes, woe to me. Woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And what I wanted to do this morning is Sean's going to lead us in a couple devotional songs. And we're going to get very Pentecostal in that we're going to open up the altar. And I would invite you if you feel convicted, to come and say, I'm a man of unclean lips. You don't have to come forward, but there's something about coming forward where you humble yourself. And God meets us in humility when we get over ourselves and we say, God, I need you. He's on it. And so you can come forward as we worship. This is something of a prayer that I asked Sean to lead us in. You can come forward and just say, woe to me. I'm a man, a woman of unclean lips. Would you deal with me, God? I wish I could tell you that what you need is to get your mouth washed out. You need to get your heart washed out. And only Jesus can do those things. So you can sit and let the Holy Spirit search your heart. You can come to the altar and say, here I am, Lord. Deal with me. When Sean's led one of the songs, he'll release you following the song. And then he'll sing another song. And you're welcome to continue to stay. If you've got kids next door, maybe send one and the other can stay. So whoever's got a dirtier mouth can stay and (laughs) send... Send the other one next door. Jesus, thank you for being what we need. Thank you that I I don't need to be in the presence of another person. I need to be in your presence. I ask that you'd come, Holy Spirit, and convict us. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew right spirit within me. Yeah.
Inside me, more of you, God. Inside of me, I need more of you. Inside of me, God, I need more, more of you, God. Inside of me. the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart bless your name bless your name Jesus and the deeds of the day and the truth in my way speak of you speak of you Jesus for this is what I'm glad to do. It's time to live a life of love that pleases you. And I
Jesus, there's no one like you, Lord. Who else could both show us our weakness and love us perfectly at the same time? I don't know anyone who's like you, God. I feel completely loved and totally ripped open, God, at the same time. Who else is like you? There's no one like you. And we gladly surrender to perfect love today. These areas that you're pulling out of us, God, and it's not because you're out to just fix, fix, fix. You want us to be alive, 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 God. And there's no one who loves us like you and cleans us like you and rips into our hearts like you, and we feel so loved. And we just thank you for your son, Jesus, who just makes the way for this to be possible today. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us in our weakness. Thank you for loving us with our wicked hearts. Thank you for calling us what we are not. There's no one like you. We bless you and we exalt you. We worship you. We honor you today for your work inside of us. Yeah. Hey. Um. I just, I felt uh, Jesus say over, you, you can do this. He wouldn't ask you to bless those who persecute you if you couldn't bless those who persecute you. He wouldn't ask you to forgive those who've hurt you if you can't forgive those who hurt you. He's not teasing you with these statements. And I felt like Jesus was over us, looking at us, looking to us and saying, you can do this. You can bless with your mouth. You can sow life into people who've done things to hurt and harm you. And I feel like as we leave, not just to repent of the harm that we've done or the gossip that we've spread or how we've transmitted disease, I feel like we're supposed to step out and bless. I feel like you're supposed to bless those that you've been gossiping about, that you're actually to sow life into people who've hurt you. And so life into those that you're trying to um, get back at. So just as we close, would you do this with me? And would you speak life? We bless. We bless. We bless those who've hurt us. We speak life over those who've wronged us. Just in your heart, maybe under your breath, so you don't obviously publicly kind of display them. Just say, I bless so-and-so. I bless them from my heart. I speak life over them. I'll no longer delight in evil, but I'll rejoice in the truth. I'll no longer put their weakness on display, but I'll cover their weakness. I bless them with my mouth. I bless them from my heart. Speak life. 
We ask that good things would come to them. As you go, church, keep speaking life. Keep doing what Jesus asked you to do. He's not teasing you. He means what he says. You're free to go and free to stay. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life I'm a pilgrim here on the side of the grave